Welcome. Welcome. Great. Welcome to the 2006 NMC Summer Conference. We anticipate this conference to be the best ever. Of course, it's here in Cleveland. <laughs> we have over 400 conference registra registra registrations, and we have over 90 sessions happening. We're so excited to have NMC in Cleveland this year. As conference chair, I would like to recognize the co-hosts of this event, along with Case Western Reserve, there's the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Cleveland Institute of Art, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> Many events will be happening over the next few days. Keynote speakers, conference sessions, five minutes of fame, online and artistic experiences, and many ways to gather together. One event in particular stands out in my mind. You know, we'll be jamming at the Rock Hall tomorrow night. What a great example of what NMC stands for. Inspiration, innovation, creativity, collaboration, improvisation, and fun. For this week, NMC stands for New Media in Cleveland. Um, let me introduce Lev Gonick, who is our, who is Case's Vice President um, and CIO. And so, Lev, come on down. And he, I should mention he's also the board of NM, the chair, the board chair of NMC. Okay, now you know why Wendy looks so big. Welcome to Cleveland. <laughs> Woo! Uh, it's great to have you all here. I just want to make sure that you put away your pen knives and stay not etching out anything in the, the lovely little wood chairs and so forth that you're sitting in. Gum should also be swallowed rather than put under the uh, mahogany wood. This is where intro biology happens, if, if, you know, no, or if you're getting bored and tired, we can also flip to the surgery, heart surgery, open heart surgery that's going on across the street at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, this is going to be uh, an absolutely wonderful uh, couple of days together. I also, uh, best I know, Wendy, tonight's the night we're rocking at the Rock Hall, so um, if you had plans to go to the symphony tonight, please consider changing the plans uh, to join us at the Rock Hall. And if you did happen to bring anything that uh, makes noise, uh, please be sure to bring it with you down to the Rock Hall. Um, I want to uh, just say a couple words about uh, the f being here in Cleveland. Um, and again, for uh, many of you, um, I understand this is your first visit to Cleveland. And, and Greater Cleveland has got a, an amazing story when it comes to, to media and to art. Uh, and you're going to get a chance to experience some of it uh, through uh, the next couple of days being uh, here in the in University Circle. Um, I want to sort of share with you that Cleveland uh, as a whole is uh, actually a very, very large, vibrant community. The city itself, of course, has gone through a heyday, uh, has worked its way through some very tough times, and is, of course, you're sitting in the heart of the renewal uh, of Cleveland. Uh, Greater Cleveland is actually about three and a half million people. It's the 14th largest uh, sort of metro, uh, metropolitan uh, area uh, in the United States. Uh, the city itself is uh, working its way back up to about a half a million people uh, or so. Uh, for me, I also just wanted to share with you that this is the third time, and I, I do believe I hold the uh, dubious distinction, the third time that I'm actually hosting uh, the New Media Center's uh, New Media Consortium uh, gathering. Uh, how many of you were with us back in, in 97 when we hosted at Cal State... Polytechnic in Pomona. Great. Well, there's a good 10% of you. And how many of you came back in 2001 at uh, Mon beautiful Monterey Bay? Go. All right, John. <laughs> Great. Well, more like 20% of you. You know, the NMC is uh, really an amazing organization uh, with uh, really a distinguished career. Uh, you can obviously read lots about the history of the organization, which goes back 
really to the, uh, really the, the origins pre-internet, the origins of, of the notion of, of computer-based uh, media experiences uh, more than a, a dozen years ago. And, and this, of course, um, is uh, part of the legacy of which we're celebrating this week uh, together here. It's uh, particularly exciting for us to have you um, here in University Circle. Um, University Circle is a fascinating, fascinating place, and it's all walkable. I know we have buses for all of you to get from, from this uh, small little three-star hotel um, over to University Circle, uh, but it, it's about a nine-minute walk uh, from here, um, and so if you and your families or significant others are in the neighborhood, there's just so much to take advantage of. University Circle is really about uh, a... a a community, it's uh, 480 acres, just under a square mile, um, of more than 45 cultural, uh, research, healthcare, uh, university uh, institutions in, uh, that really got going about 140 years ago. And so it has this absolutely wonderful, wonderful, uh, well-developed uh, green spaces with uh, lagoons and, and parks and bicycle trails. And if any of you are looking for places to jog, um, you, can, you can jog from here through Rockefeller Park, that is to say, the Rockefeller of Rockefeller Park. Uh, you can go all the way down to the lake, or you can actually see where, uh, where Mr. Rockefeller is buried, which is just up the way, uh, in a beautiful, beautiful Tiffany uh, mausoleum uh, in, um, in, the, uh, in the cemetery, uh, just uh, on the other side of University Circle as well. Uh, the, the university in University Circle is Case Western Reserve University, and, and I have the pleasure of uh, working uh, with Wendy um, and about 2,400 faculty uh, and about another 3,000 uh, support staff, including Wendy and her team. Um, the uh, university uh, is known for many, many things. Uh, it has the distinction uh, in its uh, School of Medicine, uh, really one of uh, the most innovative uh, and really gr uh, ground-setting uh, universities for healthcare education, uh, going back now some 60 years, actually beginning what we know in the United States as healthcare education, and a complete reinvention of that curriculum, which we in the technology community are, are excited to be part of, and, and Wendy and her team um, are partners uh, in that reinvention, which, which will include um, more than ever uh, the use of technology in innovative ways. Uh, we are also uh, in our legacy, uh, part of what is known as the Case Institute of Technology, CIT, uh, which itself is kind of the propeller head geek uh, side of the house. And uh, again, uh, a distinguished uh, history there. Between those two schools alone, there are uh, 14 Nobel laureates um, and a really part of a distinguished uh, research community that also includes uh, a vibrant and, uh, and very engaged uh, College of Arts and Sciences, a law school, school of uh, dental medicine, uh, nursing, as I mentioned, engineering, applied social sciences, law. Um, and I hope that you'll all have a chance to, uh, to, to venture across uh, the university um, through these next couple of days. A lot of our activities are actually going to be in the School of Management, uh, which is the Peter B. Lewis building uh, designed by Frank Geary and uh, represents, if it's a nice, and it is going to be a, a nice day today, be sure to bring your sunscreen if you're going to be walking from here to the Frank Geary Building because of the uh, reflections that come off the roof. Um, it's better that than in the wintertime when the ice comes down the, uh, and shoots off. So consider yourselves lucky there. I just want to say one last thing before I turn the chair back to, uh, to Wendy uh, to introduce our, our wonderful and distinguished uh, keynote this morning. Um, and that is the role of technology uh, at uh, the university um, and uh, in University Circle and more broadly across the community. Uh, Case Western Reserve University takes great pride in the legacy uh, of technology, which in fact goes back well before uh, networks. Um, I'll skip those 140 years of the university's technology tradition and just uh, invite you to take a look at the web pages if you want to learn some about that. But Early, early, early on, in uh, 1983, 84, um, I remember at the time being a graduate student up in Canada uh, and hearing something uh, early on about something called Freenet. Any, how many of you remember Freenet? Great. I mean, that's 70% of you here. 
Uh, Freenet, uh, actually, uh, Freenet is a Case Western Reserve University original, original contribution uh, to networked communities, well before there was a, a Mosaic browser. Uh, the notion of actually creating repositories of what we hoped would be useful and engaging information uh, shared uh, over uh, simple things like uh, Gopher and other kinds of, of ways of accessing uh, online information. And the tradition of Freenet um, continues at Case Western Reserve University, uh, both in the networked uh, infrastructure and more excitingly than the infrastructures, the applied applications, uh, creating distinction in the areas, again, of, of medical research, um, in the areas of uh, humanities, uh, arts, dance, music, uh, engineering, uh, ongoing exciting uh, use of, of, of the, the network for video conferencing. Uh, I'm mindful that this year our Nobel uh, laureate nominee a case, Michael Scharf, uh, who some of you may know from many, many presences on, on television, if you are a, a netizen as opposed to simply uh, someone who sits in front of the TV, Michael's uh, uh, blog and uh, webinars, uh, video conferences on uh, the trial in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Iraq uh, with Saddam Hussein, he was actually the lawyer uh, who helped to train the judges uh, in, uh, in Iraq uh, for the trials that are going on. Uh, that particular blog and uh, webinar and video conferencing uh, down, uh, downloads and hits are, are in the millions on a monthly basis. Uh, so the distinction in terms of the campus uh, continues in exciting and in profound uh, ways. Uh, in the circle, we're excited to have partners, as Wendy shared with you, uh, like the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Cleveland Institute of Art and the Institute of Music and the Botanical Gardens and the Natural History Museum and a Historical Society and so forth, all of which are connected to uh, a world-class network, all of which enjoy um, a cloud of wireless connectivity. There's some 1,500 wireless access points in University Circle, so that the moment that we kind of migrate from uh, this private institution, the Intercontinental Hotel, to the public space uh, just across the way, uh, you will uh, enjoy uh, being uh, reconnected and uh, to your friends and family who I'm sure are wondering why haven't I heard from them in the last uh, 16 minutes after all I always hear from, from my friends in real time. Um, the, uh, the, uh, again, the connectivity is just the beginning of the relationships between the institutions and university circle. Uh, there are exciting collaborations between the Museum of Art and our library system in our community, between the uh, Institute of, of Art and our public broadcasting community, uh, between the university and our public high schools and uh, systems, um, and between our hospitals um, and each other as well as, as the school systems. Uh, that, those projects, that coordinated effort uh, that goes on here, uh, it's very much uh, centered uh, at the university, but now encapsulating a huge part of our broader community is a project called One Cleveland. Uh, it has uh, received uh, both national and international distinction for trying to leverage technology to address community priorities uh, and creating both uh, a wired and a wireless infrastructure to support collaboration and community building. Uh, later this, uh, over the summer and uh, by September the 13th, which is um, our CASES Community Day, uh, there will be um, a, a wonderful extension of the connected community that we enjoy in University Circle to 5.7 square miles around the uh, university, uh, touching dozens of healthcare, uh, community healthcare, community legal, uh, churches, community centers, uh, schools, um, all connected to uh, the One Cleveland uh, uh, Mesh Network. So we're again extraordinarily excited to have all of you uh, here. Uh, we hope that you take full advantage uh, of your time. Uh, there's a, just a, an enormous amount of things to see. Uh, I do encourage you to stay right to the end, not only for a brilliant closing keynote address, which, which I can attest to personally, because uh, Wendy and her team and myself have worked with uh, Merlin Donald in, in what will be an extraordinary way to close the conference, but also for you and your friends and family that want to stick around. Uh, please join 100,000 Clevelanders and visitors Saturday uh, at noon at Parade the Circle, uh, which is the biggest fun jam uh, that we have uh, for, uh, for uh, percussion and costuming um, and dancing, which happens right across the way from the Peter B. Lewis building uh, Saturday 
uh, right after um, our meetings uh, officially conclude. There are parties going on this town tonight, tomorrow night, um, and Saturday. Uh, it's a town that loves to party. And uh, with that, uh, Wendy, why don't you get this party going? Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to take a minute now to introduce our keynote speaker, Brenda Laurel. Um, she is a designer, researcher, writer. Her work focuses on interactive narrative, human-computer interaction, and cultural aspects of technology. Brenda's career in human-computer interaction spans over 25 years. Brenda was one of the founding members of the research staff at Interval Research Corporation in Palo Alto, California, where she coordinated research activities exploring gender and technology, and where she co-produced and directed the Placeholder Virtual Reality Project. She was one of the founders and vice president of design of Purple Moon, focused on making technology for girls. She has worked as a software designer, producer, and researcher for companies including Atari, Activision, and Apple. She serves currently as chair and graduate faculty member of the Graduate Media Design Program at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California, and is also concurrently working as senior director and distinguished engineer at Sun Microsystems Labs in Manola Park, California. Brenda has published extensively on topics including interactive fiction, computer games, autonomous agents, virtual reality, and political and artistic issues in interactive media. Brenda Laurel has become the techno diva of technology. Her views on human computer interaction, human, yes, human computer interaction are some of the most widely quoted in the field today. And given her theories, it is no surprise that her original background is not in computers, but theater. She brings a fresh perspective to the commonly thought cold relationship between humans and their machines. Brenda has, an, has been an inspiration to many people in the way she combines geek knowledge and humanistic values. She is an incredible speaker, funny, passionate, and thoroughly steeped in professional research. Today, Brenda is going to speak to us on new media in higher education, students looking forward. Let's welcome Brenda. Howdy, thanks to Wendy and Larry and Nancy and everybody else. This techno diva thing, I gotta tell you, the reason I've made money as a consultant in, in the human computer interaction over the years is because I can break things by looking at them. <laughs> uh, I brought the wrong connector today, you know, somebody had to go over to the university. So that's, uh, maybe it's just the ignorance part that makes it work so well. So here we are, Cleveland. Wow, Lev, it's so impressive. Uh, the last thing I heard of Cleveland was Randy Newman singing, Cleveland City of the Lights. <laughs> Anybody remember that? <laughs> We'd all like to forget, but it is one of the few good things that Nixon did when the Clean Water Act came out of that little burning river incident here. So we have to be, <laughs> we have to be happy about that. Um, so I want to talk today about things that you probably already know, but maybe this will get you excited about uh, uh, knowing them again in some different ways. Um, I want to talk to you about an approach to learning and technology that we've been developing at Art Center and that I've seen growing uh, around the country, both in secondary and higher education. Um, but I want to look for a minute at our history. These pictures probably look familiar to all of you. Um, in the beginning, there was computer literacy. I remember Alan Kay arguing with me about computer literacy, saying that it was the most important thing that kids know how to write code and program and 
I would always say, I don't have to understand the carburetor to drive the car. We'd have this conversation over and over. Um, now we're working with a whole new generation of tool using designers um, and tool using people. So computer literacy starts to mean something different than it meant when we had computer labs. Even when we had computer classrooms, uh, I found pictures on the internet of classrooms even today that have one computer over in the corner that nobody's using, uh, in secondary at least. So that model has sort of failed. In fact, I would argue that the whole idea of computers as an object of study is irrelevant and inappropriate to everybody but hardcore computer scientists at this point in time. Um, it's like saying we all use the English language and we all use writing and therefore we have to pay attention to it and sequester it and put it over here and think of it as this extra affordance that we go visit from time to time and learn about. And that's simply not how it works. Yes, there are writing classes if you need help in writing, but you're always writing, you're always using language. It's part of the deal, it's part of being human. And technology is working the same way. So my prediction for the future in higher education is that we'll see the size of actual computer science programs decrease as the people in those programs who are really focused on computer science stay there and everybody who wants to do things with computer-based tools goes and does them in the domain that they're working in um, educationally. So we'll see if that's correct. The reason I put con computer nerd up here um, is that, as Wendy man ma mentioned, I've had a fair amount of experience with, with girls and technology. And this business of being a computer nerd um, is kind of sexy in some ways. <laughs> I've married a couple of them. Uh, but, it, it <laughs> but when you yourself as a female become one, then it's, it's more troublesome. Uh, <laughs> um, so the idea here is that, uh, yeah, we need computer nerds. It's wonderful to have them around. We love them dearly. Um, we also need people who use media like they use language, like they use arm movement, like they use um, color, like they use numbers, um, that these are things that are just part of the affordances that we have as human beings. And when we look at, at today's kids, um, we see that they're already there. Um, last year, my students and I did some work on tweens. Um, this is more based on work that I've done with teenagers. Um, but the kids tell us, uh, they wake up in the morning with the cell phone in the hand talking to the friend. They, they go to SMS, they go to IM, they talk on the cell phone on the bus, they're IMing during class, they're on the cell phone some more, they come home, they're on the landline, they got seven IM windows open, they're playing on, on MySpace, and they're watching television. Um, and they fall asleep with a phone in their hand. Um, they don't have any problem that popping from media type to media type through their day to stay connected with their friends. Because it's not the technology that's driving them, it's the affordance for staying connect it. And so that, that's an insight, I think, into how we reach people in this generation with media education. Most of you, how many of you have read this book, Millennials Rising? So if you haven't, I would recommend it. You may disagree with some of it, but my research bears, bears out a, a, a most of the, the things that uh, Mr. Howe concluded in the book. Uh, this is a generation of kids who've never known life without computers, like those of us in the 50s never knew life without TV. Although I must say, I grew up with black and white TV, and I remember when Captain Kangaroo announced that they were going to go to color, and I was sitting there, and it didn't happen. <laughs> that, that's, you know, that's when my career in human-computer interaction started, human-technology interaction. <laughs> so these kids are comfortable with, the, with life and technology, and they love the boundary. Any of, any of you who've had children who have them now know the kids about two years old, they love to step in and out of doors. They're always doing this. If there's a door to the patio or the deck, I just love that change. Ooh, it's going here and then it's going there. Well, uh, these young people, the, the young people that I'm seeing in, in junior high all the way through the university love that little boundary between life and technology. And they love to step back and forth and back and forth, just like two-year-olds. Um, and they're very um, ener energized by that, that, um, that odd little connection between what's alive and what's not, or what's technically alive. Alive in a different way than we normally think about alive. These guys are always connected. They're social innovators in the sense that we see 
emerging social topologies in, in places like uh, MySpace and Second Life, World of Warcraft, that, that are ways of associating with one another and having conversations and affiliating and conducting life that simply weren't possible before, uh, before we had the kind of, of uh, computer-based applications that we have now. These guys are extruding content at an extraordinary rate. The amount of cultural production by this age group continues to be um, on a really steep upward curve. Um, they're change agents. They want to do change in the world. They are making changes in their lives. Often they're doing it at a local level in terms of volunteerism or, or activism in, in, a, in a narrow context. Less likely to vote. We still have to work on that. Um, they're very optimistic. The kids that I've been talking to have told me almost to the one that they think that the future is going to be good and they have a strong belief in their power to influence the quality of the future. So they're optimists about themselves. Um, this is a quote from Mr. Howe's book. My daughter gave me my favorite quote in this area. She said, you guys had Woodstock and the moon landing. We have Mars and immortality. <laughs> Woohoo! I hope she's right. So here are some little messages from the future. These are messages from uh, actually students in my program. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you and giving you an example. I'll show you lots of movies this morning, so you wake right up. And if it sounds too loud, the boys will turn it down. Or people, women and men, will turn it down upstairs. <laughs> so these are just provocative little images, and I'm going to dive into some of these projects. So we're used to thinking about, uh, I at least had been used to thinking about teaching media technology as, as you know, this idealistic idea of picturing the future through technology, using media technology to, to make a sketch of what the future would be like. And that's almost halfway there. That's halfway there. But when you think about envisioning the future with technology in it, then you have a horse of a different color. I can remember um, when, uh, in the 80s when Christina was running um, the Apple Multimedia Lab, uh, something occurred to me. I had been the only woman in, in the computer gaming business that I knew for a very long time, except for the graphic artists. And it was so interesting that when multimedia showed up on the scene, women with skills and talent came out of the woodwork. A lot of them worked in Christina's lab. It was because of the content. It was because it wasn't a a dumbass computer game. It was some seriously interesting thing that was coming out the other end of this. Um, and, and, and these women were motivated, and they appeared, and they were competent. Um, in the same way, um, and, you know, Alan Kay used to say to me, the best way to get wonderful things done is to have a vision of what could happen that's far enough out and ambiguous enough and inspiring enough that everything you do and everything and every, everyone else does align toward it like magnetic particles, and you're all on the same path. I give this notion to my students over and over again. Imagine the world that you're going to make. Um, it's like doing a jujitsu on their natural desire to change the world. You know, the educational institutions typically will say, well, now hold on there, Sonny. It's not all that easy. Your idealism is misplaced and we'd like you to learn these skills, and you can think about the future when you get there. And I say, no, no, that's not the right way to do this. I think we have to say, you want to change the world? Great! We're going to help you figure out how to do that. We're going to help you imagine it. And in the process of imagining it, you need to also imagine what kinds of technologies are going to be there to help you make your ideas real, regardless of what domain of interest you're working in. Um, one of the things that we look at in emerging technologies is, is that they're increasingly not just about technology, but also about social behavior. So you can make a lot of predictions on the basis of, of, of a social evaluation of, of the trajectories of change in technology. So in networking, um, because of locative technologies like GPS and the, the possibility for sensor networks. We, had, we can envision a whole new kind of urban landscape, for example, or the kind of educational landscape that Lev just explained to us here. I went to E3 a few weeks ago, and after 30 years, after 30 years of watching the game business be this boy bastion, I saw the new Nintendo controllers. Have you guys seen these things? With the accelerometers in them? So you can, you can bat a tennis ball, you can conduct an orchestra, you can fence with somebody. 
And they've got, you know, 80-year-old Chinese ladies and, and four-year-old little boys and all kinds of people that never were part of the party um, walking into these kinesthetic activities in computer gaming. It opens up content domains that, that are not going to create allergic reactions in middle-aged women, you know? <laughs> Um, it, the, the, the industry is blowing wide open as we sit here. It's just extraordinary what's happening, and I've waited so long to see this. Um, and, and it's so much about controllers. It's also about this sort of drip, drip, drip on the, on the old action gaming paradigm of things like massively multiplayer online computer games, and the way they've morphed into just social spaces. Um, Second Life is such an amazing uh, example of this. Uh, how many of you know Second Life? Do I need to, you, so you know what I'm talking about. So you see uh, people taking Second Life money and buying real things on eBay with it, and you see people taking real money and buying things for Second Life on eBay with it. So you have that two-year-old going back and forth <laughs> across the boundary, right? Well, I can imagine that that can happen in a lot of different domains than just uh, the kind of social discourse that's going on in in Second Life, but that's a trajectory we need to watch, this half-real business, what's happening there. And finally, materials as media. At Art Center, as in many colleges, we have this distinction that we, we create between industrial design and media design. And the boundary appears to be going away, uh, or at least it's getting a lot more difficult to determine where it lies. Uh, because objects can behave as media, it's appropriate to think of objects as media in some cases. And with the uh, uh, coming new technologies that we're already seeing in, in interactive objects and spaces, um, that's only going to be more so. So that there's a kind of reconfiguring of, of disciplines that, that needs to go on between media design and industrial design and architecture and environmental design as we see these new technologies emerge. And that's very exciting stuff. I'll take a minute for those of you who haven't heard me talk before to just run you real quickly through the process model that we use in our program. And what I'm trying to recommend here is that this kind of process model can be used by teachers of history, by teachers of social, social science, um, by teachers of biology, um, to help students envision what they're going to do in the future in their discipline. We start with a design challenge or a goal, as, as any project does in any kind of class. Um, the students can design and conduct their own research, uh, which has turned out to be a really important part of our program. We do human-centered research and formal research. That is, we talk to people, we study people, we do applied ethnographic things with people, but we also fool around with materials and form where design is the, is the object of study. And, 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 then, and when we're in a content domain, obviously we're doing research about that as well. Um, after the research has been understood, analyzed, interpreted, the students are invited to add their values back into the mix because, of course, they've been very objective during the research phase, um, and to take that, take what they learn and what they believe is good and right and true and ought to happen, and put those things together and make a creative leap to, to describe, to begin to visualize uh, a kind of, of system or thing that could happen as a result of their research. And the first thing they do is think about this in narrative terms. What's the story of this object this, or this system? How is it going to touch people's lives? Then they think of it in strategic terms. You know, one of the things you learn as an aging hippie is that all those failures of my early years came from um, a kind of self-marginalization that came with the territory of being a social activist. Um, and I've learned an important lesson that that's crap. <laughs> and that if you, put, if you place yourself at the center of the work, you are no longer marginalized. It just goes away as an issue. Um, so strategically thinking, what does this mean? Well, it means that if I've got a great idea, just having the idea isn't good enough. It means that I have to be muscular about how I think about getting that idea into the world. So my students, and I suggest that all students, should be asked to understand, okay, this thing that you're imagining, how is it going to live? How is it going to walk? Is it, is it going to be part of a nonprofit? Is it a service, a business? Uh, do you need venture capital? Do you want to sell it to a, a corporation? Um, are you going to start your own business? What's the revenue model? Are you going to do this on the side? Um, they need to think about that they need, because it influences the design. 
And it's, it's the piece that a lot of us missed back in the 60s. And then, of course, we make prototypes, we evaluate them, we go back and iterate on the process as much as we need to. And finally, the students make a presentation. So today, I'm going to show you some examples of things uh, from the presentations that they've made. This is a picture of our incredibly messy studio. Um, the students began their work in our program with a one-year intensive collaborative project called Super Studio. And if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me talk about that. I'll give you one example at the end of this talk. Um, but they, uh, the 12 incoming students have to collaborate as a team throughout the whole year. They're also taking uh, intensive courses in, in uh, communication design and interaction design, and they're encouraged to continue taking courses and studying in, in, the domain, in the content domain areas that they're interested in. I have kids that come from neuroscience. I have a kid coming from West Point next year. I have kids in architecture, uh, students who've been involved in social science and biology uh, who happen to have design skills and come into a design program, and, I, and they're encouraged to keep going there, you know, to keep paying attention to that in addition to working on the level of design. We try to give them a grounding in trusting their own values and understanding how their values articulate with their work. Um, they all come out, oh, I've spelled entrepreneurship wrong. No, I haven't. It just looks funny to me today. I'm sorry. When we, when we say entrepreneurship, uh, people say, oh, you want all your students to go out and start their own businesses? Well, not exactly. About half of them do, and they're successful at it. But an entrepreneurial spirit simply means taking charge of something and figuring out how it gets legs. And you can do that in a lot of different ways without being a rapacious venture capitalist or de dealing with them even if you don't want to. Um, so the student's production is, is this collective masterpiece at the end of their first year in the old sense of the word. It's really like a renaissance apprenticeship uh, where, they, where they create this masterpiece to demonstrate that they've learned uh, the methodologies that we're trying to teach them, and then they take that process into their thesis year and apply it to their own individual interests. And at that point, they are ready to become a master in the world, and when we graduate them, we mean it. Uh, my husband calls this the Moses effect, where you wave bye-bye across the water. You know you won't get to the other side yourself because you're too damned old, and your student over there is going to do something you never dreamed of, and it thrills you to death. And they need to know that that's where they're going. Um, and they need to feel the joy and delight of that and know that they're a master of their craft. OK, so how do we engage the world? I mean, we generally, we the human race, we, we the students and teachers uh, in this room. Um, here are some of the ways my students engage the world, the issues that they're concerned about. And I'm going to show you some examples of work that's been done in each of those areas and then uses media technologies in different ways, hopefully just as an inspiration and an early morning entertainment. Um, quality of life. Laura Crawford uh, produced this project last year. Her initial observation was the commodification of animals was nasty. In the city of Los Angeles, we put down about 60,000 living dogs and cats a year. That's a lot. Um, there are a lot of programs out there. There are shelters. There are issues, though, with people not understanding how to take care of animals. Um, bringing a dog back to a shelter because they have to move to an apartment that doesn't accept animals, realizing that the animal is too big for their kids, whatever it is, there is an issue with animals and how animals are, are cared for and the kind of awareness people have about, about how to take care of them and whether or not they'd make a good animal parent. So Laura designed a transmedia system that involves this, a collar, a retail ins installation, and an online community to help address this problem of the commodification of animals. So looking at the retail system, this is a kiosk-like installation that could live in, pet, in a pet store, for example. Um, and there's a, 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 an invitation to take a matching test if you're interested in getting a pet. Um, and if you, if you do that, the, the, you might get a picture of a pet that's in a shelter that meets your criteria. Our imaginary user here has decided he needs to really get down and, and take the test about compatibility so he can figure out what kind of dog he wants. When he's done that, he's made a selection. He wants something close to a Labrador or a Labrador mix. The shelter is called. The one dog representative at the shelter goes out and gets the pooch. And then something funny happens. Yes, that's right action at a distance. So this guy gets to play with his dog um, by video at, at the shelter. How, so how peppy is the pup? 
is this the right dog for me? Am I having a good time? Uh, and this guy, in this case, decided, yes, it was indeed the right dog for him. Here's the special collar. Yes, it is Bluetooth enabled. <laughs> it has a blog camera, an RFID tag, the name, name and owner number, and the, the smart fabric shifts colors to send messages to the owner, like it's time for Advantix, so it turns purple, right? Uh, Yes, the, the, uh, the dog is being tracked by GPS, so you can see where the dog is in the neighborhood. You can also see the dog's blog camera view, so you can see that he's like interested in the water here today. You can look in on him from work. Um, when you take your dog in the store, uh, the RFID tag on his, on his collar activates a display on the shelf, so if a product is really good for Kenji, yeah, you can see there's Kenji's getting four bones for this product, and he's getting a discount because he's a member of the One Dog community. And when Kenji's at his trainer, he's done such a good job, the trainer sends Kenji a bone over his cell phone. This acts as a reference later on when, when Kenji's owner wants to move into an apartment and, and the, you know, the manager's a little bit resistant to the idea. But now, Kenji has, has a website, uh, his own blog, and, <laughs> and lots of bones that are good references. This is a really stunningly cool idea. <laughs> thank you, thank you, yes. So this woman is now making uh, additions to Second Life that I can't go into, but she's having fun. Here's another approach to quality of life that's very different. Sean Randall was an army brat. He moved about every year and a half. So he had that experience growing up. He's also a member of the Latter-day Saints Church. And so he has a lot of experience in, in, in community building and, 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 and talking to people <laughs> and riding bicycles and wearing ties. Um, he's, <laughs> he is one of the, the, the best, most self-disciplined, emotionally gentle human beings I've ever met. His, uh, his project was called On the Map, and it's for military kids. This is an amazing number. These kids are moving, these, this million two kids are moving every year and a half, year and three quarters on average in the military. Um, so they're always picking up and going someplace, leaving their old friends, making new friends. And it's a chore and it's difficult. So Sean looked at that as something he wanted to try and create a solution for. Uh, so it's a transmedia system, it has a website, it works a lot with cell phones, but it, the idea is that you connect with kids to the city where you're going. You find out about stuff. You have homies before you get there. There are things to do when you arrive. Here's a great little movie he made. It's about two minutes long, but I think it's worth watching. Because it, it tells the story better than anybody else could. He just likes mean people. in his new home, just walking down the street with nothing to do. Oh, what's that? It's a poster for a dance. Sounds good. Now imagine what that would be like. Yeah, I'm walking in the door and... Oh man, it's country music. Oh. Bummer, not good, not good. So he's looking now for locative tags in the environment for kids who are interested in hip hop who are in the on the map system. These are military kids. He's found one. Sending him a text message. Meanwhile, his friend is at the dance. Looks like hip hop to me. Checks him out. Checks out his sets. Yeah, yeah, he's okay. Right, now he's got to find the place. Usually a problem, but not if you have a cell phone with a camera and a look at a tag in the environment. Yes! Cool, looks like the right kind of ball. Uh. I think this is a wish fulfillment for Sean. He's got a tremendous amount of interest from the military. Um, looks like we're going to be moving forward with this system, which is a, a great gift. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell these kids you guys clap for them. That's so cool. 
I'll go through some other stuff kind of quickly. Um, Strange Design was developed by a guy named Scott Nazarian, who now actually works for me at Sun Labs. <laughs> We're building wonderful, strange things together that are probably totally irrelevant to Sun, but that's a problem for another day. Scott, <laughs> Scott is, was fascinated with augmented reality, and since we were in Hollywood, and he wanted to figure out some, some jazzy, important things to do with augmented reality, he decided to apply a kind of fantastical idea about augmented reality to the problems faced by an assistant director on a film set. Um, so the display that you see is actually an augmented reality display that the AD would be using. What Scott was really doing was designing completely new UI paradigms that broke out of the box the traditions of UI, which we've all grown to love and hate. Um, and I'll show you a quick movie of what he did so you can get an idea of what he means by strange design. I'll talk you through.